Well, thank you for uh, coming back. I hope everyone enjoyed their snacks, their coffee. Uh, you know, out of chaos comes order. <laughs> out of order comes nice schedule changes. And I, I think it's the, the great opportunity, again, to be able to look in the room, lean upon a board member and uh, Ray, and uh, lean upon a new friend in Ken Levine, and uh, Alex had his second in command, Greg LaPiccolo, drop in so that we could have a little conversation based on the success of uh, three of the most innovative and certainly successful products in this last year uh, in terms of Mass Effect, Rock Band, and Bioshock, and take an opportunity to have three great minds talk about their craft and talk a little bit about uh, this thing called narrative, which seems to, uh, I think, organically become a theme of uh, this year's DICE, starting with Gore Verbinski and sort of wending its way throughout the conversations. And to help get things started, I've asked uh, Ricardo Torres, who is the editor-in-chief of GameSpot.com and uh, been a great supporter of the Academy and the Academy's efforts. And uh, I'm looking forward to some interesting conversation. Ricardo, it's all yours. Thank Sweet. you. Well, thank you, and congratulations, I'll say it now. I think you guys did okay last night. Uh, so let's talk about narrative. All three of your games handle narrative in very unique ways. You know, Ken's is a lot more focused, Greg's is a little bit more subtle, but very cool in, in a very kind of voyeuristic way. And then Ray's got the, the crazy one. So let's talk a little bit about how you implemented that and what it was like to to sell that through because like in retrospect, great ideas, they all worked. I think at the time, were there any doubts as to actually being able to pull that off? Somebody jump in? Yeah, you know, I think with Bioshock, we had very different goals um, than Ray's team. I think and primarily because I'm way too lazy to write that many words. Um, <laughs> And so our goal was to tell this, as much of the story in the world um, and visually and, have the, and make as much of it optional for the player so he could experience the game on a bunch of different levels. The, the gamer who wanted to really, really delve deeply could like, you know, go in and read every audio and listen to every audio diary and read every sign and really pay attention and you know, have his, have his earmark copy of, of Atlas Shrugged next to him, you know, if he really wanted to get insane on it. Um, but I, we also wanted the average guy who buys, you know, three games a year, you know, Madden, Halo, and, and you know, hopefully, you know, Bioshock, um, to be able to play it and get it and, and enjoy it without having to go, you know, go to the learning annex and take a course. Um, and, and that was really important because we had this mix of real sort of pretension and visceral gut shooting, and we want to make that work. And um, so our focus was how do, we, how, do we tell, how do we tell a story where much of it is optional and much of it is suggested rather than spelled out for people. And um, you know, I think that plays to our strengths. I like, you know, I, and I think everybody up here, all these games have great narratives. Um, and I think they're, they're very, you know, they go from sort of the, 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 the most suggested, the most sort of like, um, uh, implied narrative to something in the middle, to something that's quite explicit and glorious and, and, and detailed and really lets you get immersed in a world through uh, just such a, a fully realized space. And I think that there's, um, there, there's room for all that in the industry. And I think that the fact that we're exploring, in fact, we're, it's interesting we're sort of lined up this way. Um, <laughs> so like points on a, uh, yeah, on, a, scale. on the narrative yeah. scale. And I think they're all valid approaches. And I think it's really great that the industry is starting to figure out how to, how to tell stories in lots of different ways. Because all these games have stories. Um, and Greg and I were just talking about this backstage. And um, you know, all these games have stories, even though you wouldn't naturally think Rock Band would have a story, for, you know, just from, from thinking about it. But I think it has a really strong story, a strong narrative in it, of its own right um, when I play it through. But I, so I, I think it's, a, it's really interesting to see all the different models that, that can be looked at. I'm sure there are others. I'm sure there are others. Ray? You know, I, always, I, I slice story a lot of different ways. For me, it's really exciting to see more and more narrative in games. But I think the definition of what narrative is is continually evolving. And that's the most exciting part for me, like looking back 5, 10, 15, 20 years and seeing what narrative was 
to where it is now and where it's going to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now is even more exciting. I, I, I see it. There's many different ways to slice it. There's many different spectrums that we can position narrative on. I, I, the one I start with probably is with a sort of open possibility space to more closed, focused possibility space. So you look at a game like Oblivion, Bethesda's games tend to be more open, emergent worlds with narrative, but it's often player-generated narrative and a more freeform, dynamic, emergent kind of narrative. Uh, Bioware's games, I, I often see them sort of in the middle. Sort of they've got a lot of emergence, a lot of open world possibilities, and a lot of opportunity for choice, but there's, there's still a common, there's this thread that we're leading players along, and they can go off that any time, that, almost like a tree with branches, and you can go off at any time and kind of, it flows, but it's still like directed. And then um, games, uh, two of my favorite games this year, I mean, obviously Rock Band is one of my favorite games, Bioshock and Call of Duty 4, I think are examples of uh, a more directed kind of experience on the other end of the spectrum where it doesn't feel linear, uh, it's not a, it's a, but it is in a sense a lot more linear than our games or Bethesda's games. And, but there's still a lot of opportunity for choice, but it's still a, a tight, very, very polished experience within a narrative flow. And a lot of it is expressed in different ways than how we express our games too. I think that's another interesting axis to consider games narrative uh, on is how the expression of narrative occurs, whether that be through words or voiceover, which is a lot of the narrative in our games. But increasingly, we're, we're adding other ways to express narrative as well, like through gameplay and through pacing and through actions that are kind of subtle things that you can notice and not notice. I admire uh, Rational's work, Bioshock, because a lot, because the you know, the, the narrative is expressed in a, in a in more of an observant way where you have to be there, you have to be a participant in the space to see the narrative unfold. And you may miss some of it, but that's a great reason to replay it or, you know, the water cooler talk where you talk with your friends and you, and you hear different things. And I'm always excited in our games when we see our fans talking about different things or our employees, you know, at the end of the game, we know we've succeeded right before we launch when our, our own employees, all the, all the great teams are, are actually having different experiences throughout the, the game. I, I also think there's other ways to look at narrative. I mean, we've, we've changed uh, a lot of things in terms of the, the, the detail level. So going really micro, the, the level of polish we can put on the digital actors uh, that are at the core of most of our experiences, because we are we're human. And at the end of the day, you know, it is about conveying emotion in some form. You're trying to make people fulfill an aspirational fantasy or uh, experience some emotion that's memorable. So 10 years later, you, you're always talking about, remember that moment in a game where that great thing happened. That's, that's the emotion that we all aspire to. If we just get one of those in a game through, through the conveying a, a great narrative, then we've succeeded. And I think all the games that were nominated this year, that's the thing that struck me more than anything. This year was a game of emotion. This was a, a year where, because of the fidelity of the experience and the polish and the tightness of it all, you were able to convey emotion at a level that wasn't sustained before. I think that's an amazing trend. It's amazing for the future of our industry. I think the other thing, I think you can convey narrative in different ways. This is my, I'll, 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 this is my last point, and then we'll move on, I guess. And I was trying to think of something smart to say uh, while we, were, we heard about we were going to be on stage. So this, this one is probably the most speculative of, of all these. I was, I was actually thinking about doing a talk on this at some point, but it, it's not fully formed yet. But I think narrative can be expressed in different ways. So there's the narrative of a story and character interaction. There's the narrative of a multiplayer experience, a social experience, where it's sort of external to game, but internal to game. There's the narrative of a community of people outside the game interacting and talking about the game, observing it from afar. That's a narrative of a different sort. There's the narrative of the gameplay as it unfolds through the pacing. And it's like, is the pacing right? That's a form of narrative, I think, uh, a different kind of narrative. I know I'm kind of stretching the definition. And another form of narrative is progression or customization of characters. So it's a personal narrative. It's a very intimate narrative of you and your own character, say in a role-playing game, where you're developing your character, you're signing points, and it's, it's your, your personal expression, your identity embodied in this avatar that's sort of a, the aspirational fantasy of whatever, whatever the game's trying to fulfill. That's a narrative of sorts as well. It's, it's very personal, intimate, but it's unfolding over time. There's narrative of combat, sort of a, a boxing game, you know, like. A, that's a narrative of sorts. You know, it's an intimate dance. Maybe it only lasts a couple of minutes, but it's a narrative. It's poetic to watch. I think there's many different forms of narrative, and I'm, I'm, the thing I'm most excited about is how many of them are reaching new levels of quality, and it's just it's a great time in the industry. Just to, to build on something um, Ray said, 
I always thought Civilization as a game had a great narrative because it was, you know, there's no words in it, there's no dialogue, but who who's played Civilization doesn't remember, you know, God, God, you know, damn those, you know, Scots, they, you know, they, they kept harassing, you know, this one city they kept taking back from me. Yeah. And, and that's a narrative because it's, it's you're totally your own, you're totally in control of it, but it's very, abstra it's an abstract narrative, but it's a narrative. And um, it's like layers of an onion almost where, you know, there's the detail level of your own your own army, and then there's the macro level of the interactions between the different civilizations. Yep, and um, you know, the, the, I, I think we have we've the industry has done a good job of expanding what a narrative can be, and the more we can move into spaces that are uniquely ours, um, you know, like you know the civilization example I gave, the, the, I think our future really lies there. You know, and, and what you were saying, you know, narrative of, of, of combat, narrative character growth. Um, you know, who doesn't remember moments they had in Azeroth, you know, as they were building their character. Um, you know, th 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 these are narratives without words quite often, and they're very powerful. So, now tell us about yours. I must say, it's a little intimidating to be on a panel about narrative with uh, these gentlemen that, you know, cranked out these really polished opuses with just like tons of, just tons of content. We have some loading screens and a map. And that's, you know, that's kind of our yeah. narrative toolkit. Because he wasn't the product leader of Thief, uh, which he was <laughs> um, a, a, a pioneer in narrative. Yeah, Ken and I go back a ways. We worked on Thief together <laughs> oh, ages well. ago. Um, but in our case, we had like a, a, a pretty pragmatic goal in mind to introduce the narrative, because we had this gameplay where we were really shooting for uh, you know, the goal of trying to bond people together emotionally in a band. And we had this pretty well-established metaphor. People understood what a band was and what a band does. And we wanted a toolkit to, you know, the, the, the experience within the song was working well, but we wanted a toolkit to allow people to kind of make a long-term emotional investment in, in that band. And so we basically just blatantly ripped off, you know, the RPG, you know, design tools, dumbed them way down, uh, and just, you know, stuck them on a map. And somewhat to our surprise, it worked really well. Uh, like, you know, people really seem to get into their band. Uh, but to reflect back on something that Ray said, for us it really all was all about the emotion. It was like the fact that we wanted to, to, to create this bond between players, you know, emulating kind of a standard band thing. But since people understood so much about what bands do and how they work, we could, we could cheat a lot. We had like a lot of shorthand. We just had these loading screens that show these kind of classic cliche situations, and we give you a little bit of choice about how many fans you might want to win and where you might want to go in the world, and that's it. And it ended up being kind of enough which was gratifying. But I think the fact that the loading screens, we were t and I were talking about this backstage, are personalized to reflect the character's choices and, and you know, visual choices about the character and, and the items they had bought and won for their clothing and stuff, I think that it had an impact because it wasn't, they weren't just arbitrary loading screens. Like, here, here's the image we want you to see. The player had a participation in, the, in those loading screens, which I, th I, I thought was incredibly innovative. Well, it was all we sort of had time and budget for, you know, but it was, it was like the, our kind of shorthand thing about like, okay, you, you put a lot of work into creating your character, which was a big deal, which we put a lot of work into, uh, and then just like building these little vignettes where people could be, you know, broke down in the middle of the desert with their van or whatever, you know, was, was, the, was the cheapest and quickest way we could kind of sketch out that storyline for people that they would invest in. Now let's talk about focusing those stories. Ray usually has a, a really big beast to try and shape, especially allowing players to make their own choices and kind of guide them through to this, this end. Ken's was a lot more focused, and yours is different because of the choices people make with their bands and where they go. The process of developing all this, obviously you guys all have teams, you all work together. At a certain point, everybody starts talking about it and hammering details out. Where do you draw the line between taking all suggestions and using it to enrich the story, and also making sure that the story doesn't go off into left field. Um, Bioshocks, I, I, I went back to some old documents the other day, and I looked at some of the original story documents I wrote, and they're, 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 they're fucking insane. You know, they're, 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 they're like, there's like a thousand characters, and it takes place from 1946 to, to modern day. The game took place in the modern day. And the only reason the game takes place in 1960 is because I was like, how are, how are people going to keep 50 years of events in their head? 
because that wasn't the kind of game, you know, I think in, 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 a, in an RPG, in a, in, a, in, a, in a game like Raze, you can give that kind of breath because you have the tools to express that, that kind of, of, of depth, but I really had a, it was about paring things down and, and as much as I possibly could, taking five characters and turning them into one, um, taking three notions and turning them into two or one or none quite often. Um, and I, th that, was that was really, really important. Every character in the game just became an expression of an idea. Like there were no characters who were there just for, oh, I, I like to have another character who's a plumber, you know? Like he was there to, the, to represent a particular meme in the game um, and a particular idea in the game and a particular, like for instance, a particular level, you know, Steinman in the first level, Dr. Steinman and Sander Cohen in the fifth level. Then they're all basically reflections of Ryan. You know, they're, they're you know different different interpretations of that same ideology gone crazy, um, and so we really try to limit the amount of ideas we are getting across and choose to sell those ideas really well through focus rather than um, you know trying to tell 50 million stories. Now we had you know compared to most first-person shooters, there was a lot more depth there story-wise. You know, all the audio logs and everything. But I wanted people who listen to those to, to actually be able to follow them without, you know, a Cliff's Notes and, you know, without a notebook, you know, and a, and a pen by their side. So it, 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 it's, an ex, it's an exercise in discipline quite often. I always find it it's interesting to trace back the history of, of, of studios over time. So I've been a big fan of Ken's work for, for many, many years, as, as you know. And going way, way back, you know, uh, your participation in some of the Looking Glass projects early on and, you know, System Shock 2 and... Uh, Freedom Force and uh, you know the, all the all the great stuff you've done. You can see how it builds. You know there's this is uh, foundation of, uh, that builds up. And the same with Bioware. We have great people. They're really loyal and they stay with us many 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 years. And they build up this foundation. We're always trying to advance the art as, as we. And Blizzard, I see Mike nodding. It's like I see. I know you guys do the same things. That you're always building on the foundation of, of your games over the years. And I, I know for, for Bioware, it's it's these are the difficult choices that we make. Um, uh, throughout the development cycle. It's a very collaborative process, so it's, it's actually really hard for me to say when does it get decided and when you just you know, chop. I mean, there are obviously moments that occur there, but it's a very rational, collaborative uh, discussion. It's a meritocracy of ideas where everyone is just very accepting of, yeah, that, that is a better course. And, you know, they, they, it's very humble, and people are willing to, to change direction if, if it's a better course. In some ways, it's easy because we have great, great writers, and we actually have dedicated game writers that are full-time designers, writers, and they, you know, they, sometimes they come from linear media. Um, not all of them make the leap uh, well to non-linear media, but those that do, you know, they're able to take the best practices and principles of the linear media to our medium, which is a very different one. We, we often spend six months to a year building this body of knowledge around the intellectual property. You guys probably do similar things, just sort of the what is the world you're living in? It has to feel real. Uh, arguably, most of our content gets created in six months to a year, and I think it's probably true of a lot of a lot of titles. But a lot of the hard work is actually figuring out what where's the possibility space that you're where you where you live, and it's almost like this iceberg where 90% of of the work that's been put into a game will never be seen by the players or the fans, at least not in that installment. There's always the, the opportunity to create new installments with a different, uh, different focus each time. But it's the tip, the tip is the part that's so hard to decide what to show and which characters to put in your game, which ones not to put in the game, and which ones to put into a prequel novel or which ones to put into a, the sequel. And it, it's really an art form to figure out what you do. But for us, the reason why I think our games in some measure resonate is, is a number of reasons. One, we focus a lot on activity chains between, so it's not just story or narrative, but it's also how, how they intersect with the combat, exploration, progression. It's like you've got to have this perfect, I'm not saying we do it perfectly, I, I, I aspire to that in the future, but I know we have a long way to go. But, but we're always in trying to improve that and tighten it so that the pacing improves between those, so that the narrative flow, be, even between the different things you're doing, the pacing is improving. Um, but I think the, the expression really of the story it's really coming from this foundation of knowledge we build during the course of development. And it, it, it becomes real because so much effort is expended building this, this, all the IP that surrounds our games. And that's, that's, I think that's the, real, that's the reason why our games resonate, they feel real. It's because there is really a, a universe we've built. You know, we have a team of 20, 30 people building this world for six to 12 months, 
creating concepts of all kinds of areas you never get to go to that might be referenced in passing in a, in a comment just from a bystander you walk past, you know, the, the kind of the interjections that make the world feel real. And, and that's, that's what creates the possibility of it all. It makes it, the story resonate. It rings true because there's that, that the truth is behind. It's that iceberg underneath the surface. It's sort of like a, a sculptor has like a big piece of stone and they carve it out from this, they carve their statue out from the stone and their challenge is, you know, chipping away. Unfortunately, when you make games, you have to make the stone first. And then, and so you do all this work, creating all this content, building this giant fucking rock, and then you take out your chisel. And, you know, and I think the challenge is, you know, you chip, 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 and ooh, I should have chipped that one away. Uh, you know, and, and you ship with that sometimes, you make a mistake. But generally, I think the problem is people don't chip away enough. Um, and, you know, because it's, look, it's very natural to want to protect the, your babies, you know? Yeah, if, if you write it, you know, it's like, the, like, then you have that commitment to, oh, well, I wrote this, I created this stuff, it's got to make it to the yeah, audience, I, I, you know? Abso absolutely. And, and that's every, dangerous. I mean, every it's artist funny. needs an editor. Uh, Sorry? Every artist needs an editor. E so, yeah. Yeah. They well, always get better. Here in, like, Ray talk about, um, you know, building, building the narrative world. Back in the Thief days, that was very much kind of our mantra, you know, is that we spend a ton of time just fleshing out the environment, and then we used, like, a pretty tiny subset of it actually in the games, but there was like this like toolkit, so whenever somebody wanted to reach narratively into a certain space, there was like stuff there for them to get, but there was never any kind of requirement that they would use it. It was just like provided for them when they needed it. Yep. Now, for your story, you mentioned that people are very familiar with kind of the, the musician experience. How, how did you guys decide how far to go with it? You know, it's very basic, right? You got a manager, things kind of got better. I mean, do you foresee maybe later on down the line having a more proper kind of RPG experience where, you know, make some bad career choices, get in the dumps, that kind of stuff, or do you still want to keep it simple? We're, we're kind of debating it. I mean, I, I don't think we, we really know at this point. I mean, we, you know, we want to kind of stick with the T rating, which takes a whole bunch of awesome rock and roll content <laughs> off the table, you know, to explore, which is kind of a shame, but that's the way it is. Um, I think we're, we're worried about turning it into an RGP, an RPG, because it's not. You know, it's really a, like a performance simulator. Um, but I could, you know, once people are comfortable with this level, I could totally see like stretching it a little bit. You know, adding a few more elements, making it a little bit of de you know deeper kind of band simulation. But it's not. I don't think we have a grand plan there. I think we're just kind of inching our way along, trying to figure out what might work. I, I think it's interesting. Um, obviously, I could be accused of bias in this, but I think. I think every game, in a sense, is an RPG, because aren't you always role-playing in some, yeah. some fashion? Mm -hmm. And it, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Embrace it, because ultimately you're trying to fulfill some kind of fantasy. You're trying to allow people to aspire to something that they can't do in everyday life, or if they could do it in everyday life, they're not doing it currently. So you're, in a way, everybody, you're always role-playing, and that's what video games are for. That's why, in some measure, they're fun, is because you get to do things you can't do easily, at least. Yeah. For, you get to be a rock star. I mean, that's awesome. Uh, Absolutely, but it seems like in, in, in games like, you know, like Bioshock, it's like there's more, you just inhabit, it's first person, you just inhabit this character, and, and so everything kind of flows off of that, whereas us, it's fragmented across these, other, you know, like there's a map, and the map has nothing to do with the performance, and then there's all these questions about, okay, how much do you load onto the map before you start to dilute the core experience, because you've got to splice things, these things together that are really not have nothing to do with each other. I, 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 think, I think games, I think sort of what we're saying here is that games are about a core fantasy. Quite often they're about a core fantasy, to be you know, an interstellar space hero or to be a rock star. And that was a problem we actually had on Bioshock, was what exactly is the core fantasy of Bioshock? Yeah. And that's when we did some testing on it, people were sort of like, scratch, the audience was scratching their heads, like, who am I? Like, who is this dude? And the, we ended up, the, pro, the whole, you know, the whole notion, spoiler alert here, so cover your ears if you haven't you know, got to the part, um, of the player being a cipher was sort of a happy artifact of that fact that I never really bothered to develop a main character. Um, and so I said, well, well I just screwed that up. You know, how can I make, take advantage of that mistake? And um, a lot of those plot twists came from the fact that we were sensing there was a lot of problem that we didn't have a core fantasy because who doesn't want to be a space hero? Who doesn't want to be a rock star? Who doesn't want to be a, you know, a, a, a tool in a objectivist failed utopia? You know, like <laughs> it, it, it was a problem. It was a problem. 
I always, I always saw Bioshock, it, it, it's, it's almost like an everyday man thrown into extraordinary circumstances and just how would you respond to that? Because sometimes it's as much the environment that shapes the story, the narrative, and, that, and that's a different way to tell narrative, is how actually you're responding to the events around you as opposed to having the events that you're trying to follow through. And they're both valid expressions. And I would have said, like, you know, a year and a half ago, I would have said, you know, Ray, you're right, and that's what I'm doing. And then we showed it to a bunch of people and they were really pissed off. Okay. Um, and that was, I surprised me too, because I never thought about it in a first person game. Like, because the, the marketing guys kept saying, well, you know, well, who, you know, who's going to be on the cover of the game? And I'm like, well, you know, put the Big Daddy on the cover. He's cool. And they were like, well, but then the players will think he's going to be the Big Daddy. I, I, I don't know if I, what I thought of that notion, but... I remember when, seeing the ads, and I was confused at first, too. And then I played the demo, and I was like, I got it. Yeah, so, but that was an issue, that they didn't have sort of this person to hang, you know, the game yeah. on, yeah. where yeah. you guys, you know, have... have we the, struggle with that, too, actually, all the time. It's variable, because, right? Because uh, Mass Effect was one of the first games... Uh, not the only one. I mean, it was one of the first ones where we had a, maybe the, maybe it was the first one. I'm trying not to remember the other ones, but we had a defined character that was sort of the, the marketing focus. Yep. And we certainly allowed the player to be male or female. You could customize your appearance. Uh, you could you'd be anybody you wanted. But in the past games, we've always focused more on our villains, which is really tough in a narrative game for sequels because we usually kill the villains. You know? so, <laughs> but uh, that's another story. Hey, but, killing a villain's no problem. You can, we, but then, it's, but, it's, but it's tough then to use them as like the marketing that's true. The yeah. face for the game. So, it, but it's also hard if you want to make an RPG where you have complete flexibility of who you are, because um, it's actually hard to tell a story then, because then you have to kind of allow the player to really be whoever they want to be throughout the story. You have to allow for all kinds of different expressions of, of choice, and they have to feel equally valid. I think that, and I think that one of the reasons I, I, I can't write games like that is I don't have that, you guys have a generosity of spirit <laughs> to, like, to, to that level of variability, and the writers have, the, have the, the generosity to write all those like, moments where I'm, I think I'm much more greedy about what I'm doing, and I sort of want to tell a very specific thing. And greedy slash lazy because that's also you know I think that's 50 that times the work. Like the guys at Bethesda, I look at them in admiration at them because uh, you know that the open world nature, you know, they're they're even more open. It's like the story is actually whatever you want it to be. It's you know in a way there's, there is obviously you know, an arc story, Huge range, but, yeah. but it's as much as your adventure. It's actually explore, exploration is the story as much as anything. That's yeah. another way to tell narrative. I was astonished that that worked as well as it did. It know? was the sum of its parts. I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah talking about chipping away at the block and editing yourself, how much of that is actually influenced by something that's marketable? And, well, I mean, can you, there's not going to be like action figures and play sets. Um, <laughs> and how much does that, how, how do you guys wrestle with having something to say, having a specific kind of message and, and way of telling it with dealing with like a T rating so there's not going to be anybody cracked out in rock band, probably. Um, and you, you have know, an M rating, you might as well embrace it. Yeah, and you know, and knocking little girls around for stuff. So how did that? How does that go for you all? How do you? How do you balance art versus commerce, like we talked about earlier in the session? For I know for Bioware, we're always trying to think of both, but uh, you know, you got to be. You got to. I always think about three core stakeholders: is the your employees. You got to have a great place for them to work. They got to be passionate about what they're doing. It won't be successful if, they're, if, there's, no, if there's no creative passion. Uh, you've got to think about your customers. They've got to want to buy what you, you're making. So it actually has to fulfill some, some need, some, fa some fantasy aspiration. And you know, we are businesses, so we have to make things that actually return a profit uh, just to be able to sustain the employees, the customers long term. So, but if, you do, if you're thinking about all your stakeholders all the time, then, then you have a sustainable business. So think about it in the game, games, uh, terms of a game, then you can apply those those same values, I think. I think, I think that constraint is your friend, you know, I, I, you know, because you can make any kind of game about anything, and, and, and that can be sort of paralyzing. So for us, I think, like, having a set of constraints to work with really helps you organize what you want to accomplish, and as long as you can focus on what the core of it is, then you can make reasonable, like, case-by-case -case decisions about, like, does this serve the core or not? What's its cost, you know? And, you know, just go right down the line and hopefully make good calls. If you make good calls, then you end up with something that you can share. Strengths definitely empower creativity. Yeah, absolutely, you know? And it took a long time to figure that out. <laughs> it's not obvious. Yeah, it's counterintuitive. 
Um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, somebody's handing you 15, 20 million dollars, whatever, you have a serious responsibility to make sure they make their money back. Um, and we took a lot of guff on Bioshock about people saying, oh, you know, you betrayed the spirit of, you know, System Shock 2 or whatever, a game we had worked on before. And I think the desire, you have to sell games when it comes down to it. And I think that when two million people buy your game, that says something about what you're doing in a way that it's hard to refute. And I've always said that, you know, even when we weren't selling a lot of games, because, you know, Irrational hadn't sold a lot of games before, and when we were at Looking Glass, we didn't sell a lot of games, and we had, everybody loved us in the press, but no, we didn't sell a lot of games. <laughs> yeah, I loved them. <laughs> Ray, Ray let us, you've always managed to find that magic space since the beginning of, you know, the press loving you and selling a lot of games, and it took, I think it took us a little longer to get to that space, Greg, yes, a little did. faster. Um, and um, I, I take that responsibility very seriously, you know, that, that, that fiduciary responsibility, if you will. Um, and it sounds really boring, and, and, but I think a lot of ways it's also empowering because it makes you very honest about what you're making and saying, you know, the thing I think I said most often to the team, to this amazing team I had, was are people gonna look at this and say, oh my God, that's so awesome. And that sounds stupid, but sometimes it's very easy when you get caught up in your RPG systems, you know, in Bioshock, all these little numbers and all these little, it would be interesting system systemically if we did this and all your game design talk, to forget that your job is to amaze people. And um, that's something we keep having to remind ourselves, because if you amaze people, they'll buy the thing. And it's very easy to forget that. It's really empowering to, have, to be ambitious about it. I mean, yeah. that's, it's good to have goals like that, because that's what it's all about, really. It's, 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 about, it's not about just selling the games, but it's about inspiring those people. I mean, I, I know how I felt when I was playing games in the 80s, and if I can inspire you know, my teams, we can inspire people that way. I mean, that's, that's amazing, right? I mean, it's just, do, do you remember a game like Wizardry or something like that back in 81 or whenever it came out? It's just, yep. I, I remember how it made me feel. It's, just, I, it's my dream, is to make, to allow other people to feel that way. I want to thank Greg, Ray, Ken, Ricardo for uh, giving up their morning and uh, sharing a little bit of their insight in terms of their craft, their passion for what we all get to do. And uh, while we make the changeover for Dr. Marco Lila, I thought I'd turn on the house lights and see if there's some questions from the audience for you three guys. So the lights come up, and if anyone has some questions for three Interactive Achievement Award winners right now, grab a microphone over there. There's a mic right over there. Hey, guys. Dennis Dyack, Silicon Knights. Um, Ray, I, I want you to do that talk, and um, there's, um, there's a school of psychology that believes everything that we do is based around story, and a lot of the things that Silicon Knights has done is really looked at that, at that kind of thing, so in RPGs, real-time strategies, all those type of, types of things. So there's actually a lot of literature on that, and I would, I would love it to say it. I'll call you. Or, we'll talk, yeah, let's we'll get talk together sometime and yeah. talk, but I think that's a great we'll idea. I didn't really have a question. I just thought, I loved it. I'd love to hear that talk. I, so. I, really, I, I really do want to do that. I know I have, it's not fully fleshed out right now, but I, I'm intrigued by the idea, too, that narrative is actually much broader than just words. It's, 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 it's really the pacing and interactions and social experience and many, so many more things. Uh, yeah. Dennis, I just say that, that a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff you, you did in, um, in your game about, with the notion of, unreliable, of the unreliable narrator was very inspiring to us in Bioshock, that you weren't necessarily trusting the experience you were having on the screen. So I want to do a little shout out to you guys for that, because I thought it was a great game and um, it, you know, it, really, it really, I think, broke a little ground in that territory. And, well, thanks and, thanks and, very much. So it's Alec Carter from GameSpy. Uh, congratulations, three of you, on three spectacular games. Um, just wondering if you could snap your fingers and instantly change something about each of your games to make it better, what would it be? And uh, more importantly, what was it about the design process that kept you from doing that while you were making the game? Oh, that's easy for me. <laughs> Online Band World Tour. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just straight up resources. It was just too difficult to build in the time frame. Um, I, I underestimated how important the narrative was going to be to people, and when we, at the end of our second act, you know, the Ryan scene, when, when we had that huge moment, 
and we didn't have anything on that scale afterwards, I think it really hurt the game. And that was, you know, I think that's my, that's, I put the, the blame squarely on me for that, for thinking that um, I underestimated how important that, that mystery was going to be to people. And I would have, uh, you, know, you know, that episode of Seinfeld with George with Costanza makes the joke, and then he's like, gotta go, and you know, he takes off. I think the Bioshock could have used a little bit of that. Um, you know, <laughs> make the great joke and get out. Um, you, know, you know, if you look at the, the things that inspired us, you know, whether it's Usual Suspects or Fight Club, they generally tend to wrap things up very quickly once that big mystery is revealed. And, you know, I think I learned a big lesson there. One of the things I think we're always struggling with at Bioware is because we have so many features and there's so many things to do, it, it's always hard to just throw the player into that and just immediately have them kind of jump into it. But uh, I think a lot of games do that. They just throw you into the world and it's kind of, you know, you have integrated tutorials and really bringing it to speed quickly. So I think we're always trying to shorten that phase of learning so that, uh, you know, the, for me, my favorite moment is when you're just past the Citadel in Mass Effect and the, the galaxy map is wide open and you get to go to the whole galaxy and choose any, and that's just awesome. And it's, I wish we could start at that point. And I, we're always trying to figure out a way to get to that point even more quickly. Any other questions? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Greg, come the line. Ray Musicum, Ricardo Torres, thank you very much.